Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> hey, what's up, everybody? JD here, and it is Wednesday, July 7th. Holy smokes, how did it get to be July already? I can't believe it, man. Uh, COVID and all that stuff still going on. But, 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 I've been getting a lot of emails and calls, texts, all this kind of stuff. People have salmon on the brain right now. They're salmon crazy. And, and part of it, I suppose, at least down here in California, is July 16th is the salmon opener in the rivers. But there's good salmon fish in the ocean right now. Uh, there's springer fishing going on up in Oregon and Washington. Uh, Alaska's happening. So I guess people have Chinook, I assume, uh, is what they're really talking about. <laughs> but salmon on the brain. So I figured let's just answer those questions because these emails and things I've been getting have all been questions like, hey, what's the right hook for this? Or what's the, you know, just on and on and on and on. on. So I figured why not just uh, come and put them all in one place, answer all your questions. And if you have any, Feel free to go down into the comment section down below and uh, we'll be able to answer them live. So we'll try to get to everybody tonight. Um, what else is happening? Uh, well, we got to do the tip of the week, right? Here we go. So the tip of the week is pretty stupid, actually. But uh, in case you missed any of the episodes the past, this is episode 15, I think. Um, if you've missed any of the previous episodes, you can find them like last week's with uh, Jason Hambly of Procure. Uh, episode 14 was really interesting. Um, he had all kinds of cool insight on scents, bait cures, all that good stuff. So if you want to look at that one or any of the previous 13 before that, your tip of the week is go to my Fish with JD YouTube channel and they're all archived right there. Uh, if you click on the button, let's see, how's it go? There's uh, videos, and then you have to kind of drop down to live videos. So anyway, without further ado, let's get into some questions. So we already have some comments coming in. So let's uh, let's kick to those first. So here we go. Scott Hamilton wants to know flashers or no flashers while trolling in the Sacramento metro area. So for those of you who are not familiar with that, uh, the Sacramento River down in um, the Sacramento area is that's called the Metro section. And it's a big, wide, muddy ditch kind of thing. And we do a lot of downstream trolling there. And of course, in the old days, we trolled spinners and flatfish. And now there's a lot of the uh, rotating flashers and the cut plug stuff going on, which I've been doing very secretly for quite a while and uh, wasn't letting anybody know. And there's been some other guides who decided they thought it'd be cool to share with the world, which is cool, I guess. But um, I had a little thing going there for quite a while. But anyway, um, to answer your question, Scott. Um, mm -hmm, mm -mm. <laughs> uh, yes and no. I know I'm dodging the question a little bit. Um, what? What? <sighs> so like last year, OK, on the Sacramento, everybody had kind of started switching to the flasher thing the year before and the year before that. Last year, everybody got out there with their flashers and they didn't work that well. So um, they went back to kind of the old school methods of trolling spinners, trolling flatfish, that kind of stuff on a three-way or a spreader. And that seemed to work better uh, early on. And then the flasher thing kicked in a little bit later. So I would say um, go with both because uh, you just never know. You'd hate to be kind of pigeonholed into one thing when you get down there and uh, you know, the other thing's working. So anyway, that's, uh, that's it kind of in a nutshell. So take both Scott. And by the way, behind those rotating flashers, one of these guys here, um, the, the super bait, the, the cut plug by Brad's has been the hot thing, but don't forget you can control spinners behind that. And that's kind of what I was doing back in the old days before it became cool. So, um, don't, don't just think that it's only the, the cut bait thing. So good question, Scott. Hope that helps. Let's see what else we got. Oh, DB, you're right. Client within Trinity opened to uh, Springer fishing. That's right. I had buddies go up and do that. And I just, I don't know, fishing every day in the morning and getting up early. And my brain isn't always functioning at this time of night. So anyway, uh, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. So yeah, there's, there's salmon fishing going on everywhere. And um, at least here in California, the fall run is looking... I'm not going to say glory day is good, but it looks pretty solid. And those fish they're catching out in the ocean right now are, are really nice size. So uh, if any of you have been fishing in, in any of the California rivers in the last few years, 
the fish have been smaller. And they've been smaller in Alaska. Like last year when I was guiding in Alaska on the Togiak, it was a struggle to catch them over 20 pounds. And uh, it sounds like that's kind of the same thing going on up there on the Nushigak, Togiak this year. Um, so that's a whole nother subject, which I probably should get a biologist in here and talk about that kind of stuff because something's going on with these fish. The giant kings of yesteryear seem to be getting down. Like when I fished the clamps in Trinity last fall, um, I caught one. Well, I, my client caught one. Um, Kathy McGuckin, by the way, fisher chick. It's extraordinary if you're out there. Um, she caught the biggest one of the year, and it was plus or minus, you know, 16, 17 pounds. And <laughs> compared to all these, like, super jacks we've been catching all year, it looked massive. But anyway, um, so... Yeah, hopefully kings get bigger sometime soon. Um, all right, on to more questions. Let's see, what do we got here? James Kramer, any tips on how to keep the seals away when I'm on anchor at Sacramento River? Ooh, that's a tough one. I mean, there's ways to do it, um, but they're not legal. Uh, um, the seal thing and sea lions more, more really to the point are becoming quite the issue everywhere. I just saw a buddy of uh, mine post from Washington. I'm not sure where he was. He might've been on the cowlets or somewhere. It was just sea lions everywhere. And in pretty much it's the same story everywhere. There's a little bit of legislation going on up in Washington, I believe, uh, where they're starting to be able to, um, you know, uh, call a few of them. And then on the rogue river, they have the sea lion patrol boat that if you hook a fish down there in the estuary, they circle around you to keep them sea lions off. And they've got a little, uh, uh I guess it's sea lion hazing would be the uh, proper term for it, but they, they can shoot some not shoot at them, but shoot some, uh, you know, concussion grenade type stuff at them. Not concussion grenades, but uh, firework type stuff at them to kind of get them to stay away from the anglers. But, um, yeah, at, at issue here is um, we have exploding populations of marine mammals, which on one hand is a very good thing. I mean, these things, especially sea lions off the California coast, had been hunted and uh, just beaten to... Uh, extinction almost and then so we put the marine mammal protection act in and that has helped protect them and boost the populations now what the problem is at this point however is the sea lion populations and their food are so out of whack they've got a real imbalance going so uh in the old days when we had gazillions of salmon you could have gazillions of sea lions and and it all worked but now you have a big number of uh animals at the top of the uh the food chain and we have not as many prey items and and it's supposed to be the other way around it's supposed to have lots of prey and very few predators so um things are are screwy and, and we're seeing sea lions you know you get them all the way up uh the feather river to yuba city and above on and here in california and they're way up the columbia i mean they're everywhere and it's it's an issue so james i wish i had an answer for you uh <laughs> ryan ash says M80s. Yeah. Well, uh, again, notice I said <laughs> I, I had plenty of suggestions, just not uh, not legal ones. Um, but <laughs> anyway, let's see what else. Uh, oh, here you go. This is a good one. So Larry says, uh, James, maybe you ought to get a, uh, a recording of uh, killer whale feeding sounds and pumping it over the side of the boat. Hey, not bad. Not bad. Um, or maybe a killer whale call. I don't know. So, <laughs> ay, yeah, yeah. But um, anyway, that uh, sorry, I don't have as good an answer as I would like uh, for you there. Uh, let's see what's Brad saying here. Brad is saying we caught salmon out in front of Trinidad Sunday. The biggest was 18, ooh, 18 inches. No kidding. Uh, nice fit. Really? The biggest was 18, Brad? Holy moly. That, that, um, that's a little disturbing, a little off-putting. Of course, those are going to be up there in Trinidad, um, a lot of Klamath Management Zone fish, and those fish have been very small lately. Uh, the biggest 18 inches is a little a little alarming, though. Um, so anyway, well, uh, hopefully that gets better for you. I heard uh, Trinidad and Eureka and up that way have not been very, very great yet. So uh, hopefully that trend can, uh, doesn't continue. Uh, one more from James Kramer real quick here. Are you going to guide the Sacramento River this year? Yes, I'll be on Tahoe uh, till August 30th. And uh, Mackinac fishing, by the way, in the last few days has gotten really good. The Kokney are starting to, uh, a lot of guys are, are hitting them hard. I haven't done it much yet. Um, I am waiting for them to get a little bigger and a little more concentrated. But it sounds like easy limits can be had if you know where you're fishing. And most of it's down on the south end of the lake. Um, 
but uh, anyway, I'll be here until August 30th. I go to Alaska for a bit and then I'll fall. I'll be on the, the sack. So yes, I will be down there chasing the big Kings and we're supposed to have a good return this year. So um, anyway, all right, let me, uh, I see a bunch of more of you guys in the queue. So stand by, I got a few other questions that people have written in. So let's hit a few of these while we're at it. Okay. So this is from confused in San Francisco. I assume that's what SF is. San Fernando. I don't know. Um, uh, can you help me understand all the different plug sizes? I'm really confused about what to use and when. Okay. Ooh, well, that one confused is uh, a bit of a confusing topic. I, I agree with you. Um, so where do we start? Um, I've got some plugs over here. So uh, it gets really confusing. Uh, let's take the two major brands, Quick Fish and Flatfish. And then you have Brad's Killer Fish too, which are, are real similar. So for example, you have the K15 Quick Fish, which is a pretty, I mean, that's, that's one of the best plugs of all time. Um, just an all around plug. You can back bounce it, back, uh, flatline it, whatever you want to do. And so here's where a confusion starts. So you get a, here's a K50, oops, that's a T50. Here's a K15 right here. Okay. So they're about the same size. If I can get them right next to each other. Um, you'll notice that the flatfish here is a little bit wider. The T50 is a little bit wider than the K15. And to the uninitiated eye, these two plugs really, I mean, you'd think, what's the difference They're, You know, if you had the same color, they're the same lure. Well, and this goes pretty true straight across the board for flatfish versus quick fish. Okay. So if you were going to flatline, and I had a question about flatline, and we'll get to that, but that's basically back trolling these things without any weight. If you're going to, if you want to use this size plug, the K15 or T55 size, I got to hold them the same distance. So they, there we go. If I hold them like this, they look way off. So there we go. So if you were going to, you know, want to fish a plug this size, and this is a great size just kind of for all conditions for salmon fishing. If you wanted to back troll it without any weight, the K15 is far and away your better diver. Um, and again, they look real similar, but there's just little differences in the designs um, where this thing's going to get down. And, and I've caught fish probably mm, at least 15, maybe 18 feet deep trolling a uh, back trolling a K15 without any weight on it. Now, the T50, same size, right? This thing doesn't get down very well at all. It's not a good flatlining plug. It's very light. And the, the flatfish have a, a wider wobble, and, I, and that's why they don't get down as much. So the 15 is going to be a little tighter action, gets deeper. The T50 is a wider action, not as deep. So with the T50, and, and again, mostly all flatfish, you're going to want to go with weight to get it down or a diver. So, um, Okay, so that's the K15. Let's go to smaller size. So this is the size down, the K14 quick fish. And the, the equivalent to this in the flatfish department would be the M2. And then the Brad's killer fish KF14. <laughs> it's all the same. Um, I, I used to use the M2 over. This is the one place, the K14 and the M2, same size generally. And this is the one place where... I used to always, and I, I don't fish either one of those much anymore, but um, I would say the M2 dove better than the K15. That's the one little discrepancy in the quick fish versus uh, flatfish department. Now, since uh, Yakima Bait has added the uh, the maglips to their, their lineup, and this is a 4.5 maglip, which is roughly the same size as the K15 or the M2. In fact, the... Uh, 4.5 maglip, I think, was called the M2 Extreme or something when it first came out, and then they changed it to the maglip. This whole maglip series has really been a game changer for me. Um, whereas the K14 dives okay, the M2, the same size, uh, you could flatline that 10, 12 feet. This thing, I've caught springers on this thing in 22 feet of water, flatline, no extra weight. It's got this crazy dip, uh, a bill with a little dip in it. And uh, real tight wiggle, it's not as wide as a typical flatfish, but these are flat lining machines. If you're going to go 
back trolling without any weight and you're not fishing 30 feet of water, but anything from, you know, almost 25 really, but call it 20 feet and shallower. These things will get down and uh, get to the fish. So uh, I've really, this is kind of the plug that has um, replaced the K15 for me. A little bit different size. The, uh, the 4.5 maglips, a little bit smaller, but this thing will dive so much deeper. And, and I've probably caught more kings on these things than, than absolutely anything. Now they, uh, and really the whole maglip lineup from the 2.0 up to the, uh, the hog nose flatfish uh, are, are killer runners and they run pretty true right out of the box. You take a standard plug and it's got a, let's see, get that up there and see if it'll focus. Okay. So you got a line attachment screw right there and to tune it, you have to adjust it one way or another to get it to run straight. These things, they have kind of a built-in eye, if you can see that. And initially, I was a little concerned about that because I thought that's not going to be that easy to adjust. But these things, literally, almost all of them run straight out of the package. Now, this, uh, as an aside, we can talk about tuning real quick. So, because people ask, hey, what, what does tuning your plug mean? So, what we're looking for, let's get one without hooks so I don't hook myself. When you put a plug in the water next to the boat, and you just kind of drag your rod next to the, you know, upstream against the current. You want that thing to wiggle straight down. You don't want it pulling off to one side or other. You want it to be diving down. So if you notice it's pulling one way, you take that line attachment screw and turn it the opposite way. And a lot of times you'll overcorrect and then you'll overcorrect again. And eventually you kind of get it into that zone. And uh, if you're not in that real tight, uh, straight down diving, what happens is, this thing won't get down. If it's pulling off to one side or the other, it's not going to get down as much. And, and the fish don't bite them as much. Now, going back to the Maglip series, uh, you have what's called skip beat action built into these. And I don't know how Buzz Ramsey and those guys do that. But what these do is they wander a little bit. They're do 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 the tracking. And then every once in a while, it just kind of pulls off to one side and comes back. Do, 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 pulls off to the other side. And that little kind of uh, inconsistent action seems to really... Uh, Turn the fish on. Okay, so moving up the chain. So we did the, I kind of went in reverse order. So um, let's let's back up. So you have, starting with the kind of the smallest, I mean, there's smaller ones that you might use for springers and stuff, but generally the three or four main sizes in salmon uh, plugs. This is the Quick Fish K14, also known as the M2 in the Flatfish lineup or the Brad's Killer Fish KF14. Same size as the 4.5 maglip. You with me? I know it's confusing. Um, okay, so the next lineup in the quick fish size is K16. So the K16 is bigger than the K15. This has a kind of a wider wobble. This one still will get down deep uh, flat lining, but it's also a great back bouncing plug. The comparable flat fish, let's see, can we see these? So that's a T55. Let me. This back, the camera being backwards always messes with my mind here. So those are real similar in size, but again, totally different action. Um, this, this has kind of a wide butt wobble, the K16, real wide butt wobble, but the, uh, the head stays down. Let me get this. There we go, like that. The T55, again, is not a good flatline plug. The 16, you can get that down pretty good. The T55 in the Flatfish series, same size but it has more of a wider side to side kind of fluttery action. And when you hold them in your hands, you can feel them. this, the, the K 16 is a little denser, a little heavier. T 55 is kind of made out of lighter material and the bills are different too. So I don't know if you can see this, but eh, it's hard to tell the, the green bill right here is a little wider than the K 16. So it's just got a little more side to side wobble to it again. The uh, I'll get myself hooked. The K16 is a good flatline plug, but you can back bounce it. I would probably only back bounce a T55. Okay, so far so good. Let me grab some more here. So now we go to ba -ba -ba -bum, T60. And when you look at a T60 compared to say a K14, I mean it's a it's a huge difference. And yet, you can catch uh, just as small a salmon on this one as this one, and just as big a salmon on this one as this one. So, um, 
it, they just have different uses. And I actually have a question about where to use these. So we'll get to that later. But um, there's not an equivalent size in any other brands to the T60. This is the school bus, the big, big daddy of all salmon plugs. And there's a very distinct use for that. And uh, I'll tell you more about these. But same thing. This is a uh, this is a flat or a, a not a flat line, but a back balance plug. OK, so I hope that helps and didn't confuse you too much because there's a lot going on there with plugs. They all kind of look the same, but um, they're not. So, um, OK, so on that, we have a couple questions um, about that. So Jack Johnson, I assume not the uh, rock singer, but maybe I don't know. I think maybe he's in fishing. I don't know. Uh, Jack says, do you stock treble hooks on your flatfish or do you recommend something else? I always change them out. So. The one here is just fresh out of the package, and uh, those are, uh, I mean, you could get by with those. They're, they're not very sharp at all, actually. So I, I always change them out. And the other thing I do, so let's take a look at this guy. Uh, let me get your little question out of the way so you can see here. Okay, so um, these right here, come on, stop moving, focus. There we go. A um, couple things to see here. First of all, I've added aftermarket uh, treble hooks on there. And um, that's kind of a personal preference thing. I mean, if you got a brand you like, these I think were Kevin Dan Dam triple grip mustads, which uh, I don't know if they even make anymore, but that was a good hook. Uh, there's a lot of good owners, um, Gamagatsus. Just match the size of the hook to the one that's on the, the uh, lure in the package. And people ask, what size hooks do you use? I'm like, I never remember. I have to hold it up to the, <laughs> hold it up to the package to see, oh, that's the size hook I'm looking for. Um, and then the other thing, if you notice right here, let me get it stopped. So I've put a second split ring in between. So come stock with a split ring to a hook, just like, uh, like this one, right? So there's only one split ring there. So what I do, in addition to changing the hooks, is I add, stop moving, there we go. I add a second split ring in there. And what that does is when you have a fish on, he can twist and turn almost 360 degrees until there's any tension on there. So when he's next to the boat, shaking his head and ripping, it's a lot harder for him to rip that hook out of his face using the leverage against you. So um, you can put a swivel on there. I don't know if I have any here. It doesn't look like it, but um, you can put a swivel in between there too. But I like the double split ring. It works really well. And, and sometimes the swivel fails. This double split ring doesn't usually fail. Um, okay. So, Blake asked, do you wrap them? Yes, absolutely. Um, sardine wrap. And the problem these days is, is you're finding there aren't a lot of good sardines left in the world. Um, I think I've heard that like the, the tuna ranchers, if you've ever seen those guys where they, they put a net around a bunch of this big school of tuna and then they just feed them all the time to raise them up. Apparently those guys are eating up the world supply of sardines pretty quick. Um, the sardine here in California, which is kind of the epicenter of sardine uh, in Monterey, Cannery Row, all that stuff. John Steinbeck. I mean, that's, you know, that was made famous by the sardine. Um, that was declared completely recovered. Oh, boy. 10, 15 years ago, maybe. And now you can hardly find a sardine in California. So uh, you go to a bait shop nowadays. And the ones you find are these. You know, they don't have any scales on them. The fins are gone. They're kind of yellowishy, you know, got ice on them. And you cut them open. And like a fresh sardine has, you know, it's bloody, it's oily. It's got almost red kind of steak meat. And then <laughs> these sardines now kind of look like the color of my skin. They're just kind of yellowishy tan. And you're just like, ugh. So it's hard to find good sardines. Um, there's some things you can do to... Um, kind of improve a cruddy sardine and and one of the things i do and we talked i think last week with jason hamley about this is i'll put it in um like a herring brine overnight flay my sardines out throw the chunks in a brine that seems to toughen them up a little bit the other thing you can do is in a pinch and it's really i mean it's it's a great thing to do anyway is flay your sardines put egg cure on them there's a lot of sodium and salt in those things and that toughens them up and makes them good you can also put them in a bag of borax shake them up overnight and that toughens them up and makes them last a little longer um and then you can add scents to them um the best thing is a fresh sardine uh, it's just harder like i say to come by now you can use herring herring works okay um you can use mackerel mackerel has has its moments uh in alaska we wrap with 
tuna, believe it or not. Uh, we don't have any uh, sardines up there, so you wrap with anything you can. We'll wrap with roe. And amazingly, you can wrap on the belly of a plug, a nice cluster of, of salmon roe, or even tuna, which is amazing. You take just tuna out of a can, oil pack tuna, put it on the on the belly of the hook or the belly of the plug, and wrap it on. It takes a lot of thread, and a lot of it comes off. You waste a bunch of it, but it actually the little core of it stays on there pretty well. So I've heard of people <laughs> wrapping with bacon, and I don't know why not. So um, that's yeah, yeah. The the wrap thing, and, and make sure you change your wraps. Uh, depends on the the water temp and all that but every 20 to 30 minutes probably um sometimes in alaska we could get away with it you know one wrap or two wraps a day if you have them heavily salted and wrapped on there tight um and if you don't have wraps um you know again sardines are are, are not that great these days um you can the uh, procure again going back to talking to jason hambly from procure last week you can take that fish nip fish nip fish nip <laughs> say that fast twice um that fish nip stuff they have which is comes in a little clam pack and it's it's ground up tuna or something and it's kind of a paste and you can put it on there and wrap a little bit so um just any kind of sand and i've, I've done it where you just put a, a sticky liquid like a, a procure bait sauce on there or something like that sardine shrimp those kind of things and and that works you're i don't think that the sardine wrap calls fish from across the river to come eat your lure i think it's just a matter of masking human scent. Um, you know, yeah, you think about it, driving to the river, you stop at a 7-Eleven and you get some flaming hot Cheetos and you're eating those out of the bag on the way to the river. And maybe you chew, maybe you stop and get gas. I mean, you got, maybe you kiss your wife uh, goodbye when you leave and you touch her hair and it smells like soap or perfume. I mean, you can have a lot of funky smells on your hands and then you go and touch your lure and you transform it or transfer it right onto your plug. So, um, that, that, that sardine or, or whatever you put on there is just kind of helping to mask all that more than anything else. And I think maybe they hang on to it a little bit longer. Now, the, the greatest non-secret secret in the world is, uh, putting a crawdad piece of crawdad tail on your sardine wrap. And, uh, that used to be all hush hush, but it's, it's not anymore. So anyway, uh, okay, let's see, let's go. We got some more questions here. Uh, Ryan Ash, so split ring versus swivel. Yeah, I mean, you can do either or. Um, like I say, I like the double split ring. Again, you're just trying to give this hook or this hook, whatever fish, uh, the one that the fish has in its mouth, as much travel as possible so you can't use that leverage. And, and you can see, obviously, the swivel gives you 360, and the double split ring really pretty much gets you there too. And these are just easier, and I think they're more durable. So that's the answer to that. And uh, as far as canned tuna, yes. Uh, we're using just oil packed tuna. Same stuff you'd put inside a um, uh, one of the Brad's cup plugs. So, uh, yep, crawdad tails work too. Yep, I got to that. <laughs> so uh, let's see, what else we got? Okay, uh, da, 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 da. Scott Hamilton, what's your favorite Brad's super bait color for this lower sack? Mr. Hamilton... You can have to just book a trip, my man. You're uh, you're asking too many questions. <laughs> no, um, there's a couple. Um, there's one called Blackjack, and um, it's it's just a silver body with a black. I mean, it looks like a bait fish. Um, and then the good old Chrome with Chartreuse can't go wrong with that. And and uh, you know, I people make a lot about colors, but sometimes I think if the presentation's just right, it could be you know, red, white, and blue, it could be purple, whatever. Um, it just, it, um, you know, you gotta, it's just gotta look right to them, but you know, you can't go wrong with silver chartreuse for salmon, right? Um, what the guys on the Columbia find up river is they use uh, one called hot tamale and uh, hot lava. I think they're called bright red, bright yellow, uh, chartreuse yellow. Um, I have not done that, uh, that well on those colors, but, um, you know, give it a shot, but you know, blackjack, pretty, pretty, pretty solid color down there in the lower sack and uh silver chartreuse for sure. Um, all right. What are we, uh, let's see what's Robert Mueller. What size maglip do you recommend for the central Valley rivers? Think about buying some and trying some. So, okay. Um, 
the 4.5, like I was saying earlier, uh, super deadly. Um, now, I know a lot of guys on the sack up where you are, Robert, um, love, you know, K-16s and T-55s and those big ones. So if you go with a 5.0 Maglet, um, that, you know, the 4.5 and the 5.0 would be my two uh, choices. The, the hog nose, which is more like a K-16, T-55 size, has really, really, really loud rattles. And um, it works great on, on, on wild fish. It's kind of lower in the system in Alaska. I haven't used it in the sack. I, I just feel like it's a little too much. Um, I mean, by all means, give it a shot. But uh, the 4.5 and the 5.0, especially for flatline. Now, um, the these aren't the greatest. The maglips aren't the world's greatest. Uh, I mean, you can back bounce them, but they dive so deep. Um, they, they're not the greatest uh, for for using with a, a lead ball on there in a you know three way. So uh, just kind of keep that uh, in the uh, back of your mind. Now, going uh, uh, we're going back to cut plugs here. I think here's Steely Dan, Rene Villanueva. He likes bleeding frog red. So uh, that's going back to the cut plugs. I think right, Rene. Um, anyway, so okay, boy, we got questions coming in all over the place. All right, here we go. So Wilson says you use single side wash hooks on your plugs. I do sometimes. Um, I go back and forth. Uh, one of my issues is I think that uh, I'll put on singles and I'll miss five fish in a row. And I'll go, I hate singles. And then I switch them and I put trebles on and I miss five fish in a row. And I go, I hate trebles. And I go back to singles. And so I've, I've gone back and forth over the years. And my thoughts on this have changed uh, quite a bit. Um, I'm kind of back to troubles now, like in Alaska, for example, um, I was using, uh, and we're catching and releasing a lot of Kings there. Right. So trying to do the least amount of damage to these fish as possible. So I'm trying to figure out ways to, to make them easier to release. And so I was putting Gamagatsu open eye, big river bait hooks on there. And those are the ones that have kind of like that little sickle bend to them. And those things are absolutely deadly. Um, almost too much. Like it looked like a crime scene every time you caught a Jack or something. I mean, it just blood everywhere. <laughs> they're, they're, they're kind of gnarly. And so what I have gone to kind of my go-to now is one barbless treble on the back and it, and each plug's a little different. So you got to check the balance and I wish I, Oh, I do. I do. I have my old, my old hall of fame plug here that uh, if you caught the episode a few weeks ago, I talked about old Joe Montana here and his hundred plus kills. But um, so here's one rigged with a single side wash on the back with a with a swivel. And what I did here is this is the stock treble that came with it. I cut all the, you know, the tines of the hook off at the at the bend there just to keep the weight balance that this lure was designed for kind of the similar because sometimes you take that belly hook off and these things run kind of kind of funky. So every lure is a little different and you got to sort of play with them to make sure you're not messing with the action by putting a, a particular hook on. Now, the nice thing about the flatfish and the, the bag lips, the Yakima bait series, uh, Buzz Ramsey, who's the guru of all plug stuff. And we'll have to get him on the show one of these days. Cause it's fascinating how he designs these things. And I mean, he goes out on the river and takes a Dremel and carves the bill a little bit and, checks the action then marks them up and then goes back home and does something to them and brings them back to the river. I mean, it's really cool. We'll have to, we'll have to get buzz on there on here, but uh, uh, so yeah, you just got to, Oh, what I was going to say about that. I was getting sidetracked, getting excited about buzz. Um, Yakima bait has all these, if you look online, they have all these pro where are they tech tips or something and tell you if you want to like, okay, you got a 4.5 maglip here. If you want to run it with one single hook, they recommend which size. So it's pretty handy. So check that out online. Um, so let's see what's going on here. James Kramer, I used to wrap my quick fish lure with rubber bands. Yeah. A lot of us used to do that. The problem with it is it's kind of in a, uh, you know, with the, the stretchy thread. Now you can just get those things so tight to the, the bottom of the plug. And, uh, and with the, the you had the, uh, rubber bands on there and what would happen at least to me is the front one, you know, the plugs diving like this. The, the, a lot of times a flap of meat would hang down and, and around that rubber band and start kind of creating uh, issues for the plug diving. So uh, Cameron Beck, my man, am I hiring? Yeah, right. <laughs> You'd be the, my first call though, buddy. Um, 
next year, maybe on the Togiak. We'll see. See what they got going. But um, uh, anyway, let's see. Have you ever run a double frog? Oh, okay. So that's an interesting question. I have not on a flatfish. Now, what Robert's talking about, and I don't have one here on my desk, is if you ever fish topwater frogs, it's a, it's like a treble hook missing one of the hooks. It's, it's you know, kind of this deal, two hooks, and it's uh, you can, um, it's kind of an open eye, I guess you'd say. Um, I have not run those. I've run them on super baits. Somebody told me about, or not super baits, but cut plugs, you know, uh, behind the flashers. And somebody had told me, oh man, you know, you hear all kinds of things because those, those cut plugs, you have interesting hookup uh, ratios with those things. I mean, you talk to people like, dude, I went over 20 yesterday or last week or whatever. And, and some people catch every fish they hook. And, and so everybody's got a little different method. Uh, and, and one old timer told me about the, the frog hooks on cut plugs. And it was a tough day last year where we hooked only two fish and we lost them both on those damn frog hooks. And so I never went back. Don't let me, uh, scare you away from it because it, it seemed like a good concept it, you know you could miss two fish on any set of hooks so it wasn't really a a huge sample size i i just you know when when something's not you know a tough day and things aren't going that well and you miss a couple fish well i had to have some scapegoat so it was the frog hooks that did it <laughs> so uh anyway okay let's see, let's see if i'm missing anybody here and that 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 okay so Moving on to some more of the questions here. Okay, so this is kind of on topic because we've been talking about uh, trolling the cut plugs. So rotating flasher versus non. How do I tell? Sign Ken. Okay, so this is a confusing thing. And um, when, when you go down to Sportsman's Warehouse or wherever you go to buy uh, one of these pro troll 11-inch uh, flashers that everybody's using for trolling on the Columbia, the Sacramento, and everywhere in between, um, you have to make sure you get the pro chip model, not the hot chip. Now, uh, it, they, they should have named them something a little more uh, easy to, to remember. So the hot chip, which is not the hot one you want. So maybe keep it like that. Not so hot chip. Uh, it's a great flasher, but not for what we're wanting it to do down in the river. So let's back up. So the pro chip. You want to go pro? Get the pro chip. That's uh, that's the pro tip. So the pro chip has this little. Let's see, get it in there in the right. See this little fin right here. That's a little agitator fin or whatever they call it. And what that does when you troll this thing, it causes it to roll like this, 360 degrees. So they call these 360 flashers. That's kind of the the catch-all. So that's doing that. And as it's doing that, your bait's kind of doing a little kick and it adds some action to it. So the so that's pro. Again, you want to go pro, get the pro chip. Now, the hot chip is missing. This is a beat up old one, but uh, where is it? So here, let me hold them both up so you can see. So you got the that little fin on the back there and no fin on this one. And what these flashers do is they do a... Kind of a side to side thing and and nothing wrong with it but you want a little more action on those super baits cut plugs so that rolling action is really where it's at so again in review not so hot chip you want to go with the pro chip and for um, sacramento river uh, uh, columbia river and all that the 11 inch model is pretty much the standard now i'll have to do a whole rigging thing on these because that's that's a whole nother uh, can of worms and, and a <laughs> confusing mess at times. So um, anyway, uh, let's see. Oh, well, speaking of that, <laughs> Ben, uh, and I, like I say, I'll do uh, I'll do a whole thing on these because uh, we could talk hours on just this rig. But he's asking if I use the flasher releases. Absolutely. And and I, I should have if I'd known you had that question, I would have brought one in here. But so. Uh, good day fishing, hawking fishing, and maybe one other makes a flasher release. And it's a little wire cable that runs from up here and you install it to your flasher. And then there's a little release device here. And so when you're going along fish bites, it breaks loose the back end of the flasher. So you're not fighting the flasher. The flasher just kind of 
just lays there instead of when you're fighting a fish before without the releases you had to fight the flasher too now when the thing releases it's just kind of a little you know little flag flop around it's a lot better so you uh you end up not fighting the flasher i think you land more fish because of it so anyway um we will we will get into that one at some point as well okay uh okay here we go you talk a lot about flat uh, flatlining in your articles and videos. Can you explain more, Alex in Chehalis, Washington? Okay, Big Al. So let me go over here. And so flatlining is the act of backing a lure down the river without any extra weight on it. So again, getting back to kind of this circling back to what we were talking about earlier, you need a plug that can dive on its own. So. K15, quick fish, K16, quick fish, the maglips from 4.5 on up, uh, actually all the maglips, but um, those are all great flatlining plugs. And let me give you a visual on flatlining here. Let me get to the right page here. Okay, so here's an overview of flatlining. This is in a drift boat, but uh, you can, if you were in a jet boat, you just have the boat facing upriver and the current is going the direction of the yellow arrow there okay so you let the plugs out behind or otherwise known as downstream of the boat and they float so uh you can let them out and they just float on the surface until you get them out to how far you want to go and uh, it depends on the situation but generally uh in in muddy water that's not too deep you can run them 45 50 feet Sometimes you got to run them back 60, 80 feet. It just, again, it's kind of a situation by situation deal, but let's just call it 55 feet for argument's sake. So you let them out. The let's back up here. The boat's going to slow down. The boat's going to stop and row against the current in this case, or if you're using a jet boat or something, you use a kicker to slow your descent down. And again, in a, in a power boat, the transom is going to be facing downhill and the bow will be upstream, whereas it's the reverse in a drift boat. But in this situation, so the, the rower slows the boat down to a stop above the hole. You let the plugs out on the surface. And once you get to the pre-described distance back, say 55 feet, click the reels into gear. And because the oarsman or oars woman is holding the boat back from sliding downhill, the force of that water on those plugs causes them to dive right to the bottom. Now, once you got them down, you're going to slowly slip downstream uh, using again the oars or the motor, whatever type of craft you're in. And you're going to go about half the speed of the current downhill. If you go too fast, those plugs flutter up off the bottom and they're, they're useless. Um, so you want to, you want to go row hard enough to get those plugs digging, diving, and you watch the rod tips. You'll see them wiggling. If they're not wiggling, you're probably kind of floating up on the surface. If they're digging really hard, you might want to let the boat slip downstream a little bit faster but anyway, you get those plugs down near the bottom and you just slowly back down. The fish are facing upstream, so you're backing them right into their face. Now, you see here the wiggling wall of pain. We like to put our plugs out all at the same distance. So when you get to a school of fish, they're confronted with uh, a sort of a decision. Uh, oh my gosh, there's you know three, four, depending on how many people you have on the boat, six plugs coming at us. We're going to have to eat our way through. And so... Um, Sometimes, you know, they, they ignore the first plug and veer off and then they, they go, oh, there's one right there. And, and they're, they're all hopped up and they grab that one or or maybe they they move out of the way of two. And then there's another one in the way and they just get hacked off and they bite it. And then you can, especially with steelhead, you can back them down. Sometimes the fish will come up to your plugs, look at them and then drop back. And then they come back up and, oh, gosh, the plugs are still there. And they keep and you keep backing them down to the tail out till eventually they have to make a decision either. They got to just zip past you or bite. And more often than not, they bite. So uh, that's flatlining. We could do a whole show on that too. The, the trick here is to put the rods in the holders, or if you have very uh, patient anglers, um, you can go ahead and hold on to the rods, but uh, you have a much higher hookup ratio if you put the rods in the holders at about a 45 off the bow in that situation with drift boat and just letting them wiggle. And when you get bit, Usually you get kind of this thump, thump, thump. And, and if you're holding the rod and you're not used to this, you're going to probably uh, jerk too quickly and uh, let that fish get away. So by putting it in the holder, you got that thing and it goes, don't, 
boom, and then starts doing kind of two or three pumps. Once line's coming off the reel, then you can just pick it up, and uh, usually you have them. And what's going on there is, okay, so the plug's back and downstream. Do, 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 do. Fish grabs it, and that's that first kind of pump that you that I showed you. Now, if you jerk on that first one, a lot of times you're just pulling it right out of his face. So if you let that thing wiggle, he grabs it, you start shaking his head, and that's when your rod's pumping. And a lot of times they'll turn downstream, and that's where when they turn downhill, they can get that hook in the side of the jaw. Whereas if, you know, you think about it in the situation, like if I'm angler holding the rod, my plug's out, out in front of me, and the salmon and I are looking straight at each other. And, you know, we're facing each other. He comes up and grabs it from straight below me, and I jerk. I'm, I'm pulling it straight out of his mouth. Whereas if you let him turn with it, you're going to get him hooked in the side of the jaw. Not always, of course. <laughs> that's uh, that's just the, the way uh, of the world. And by the way, um, if you want to learn more about this, you can go to Amazon.com. And I have an ebook, so you can read it on your Kindle or your computer or whatever, uh, called Plug Fishing for River Sam. And it's like, I don't know, three bucks or something. And it's got all kinds of diagrams like that one. And then here's another one just to give you an idea. It's got uh, how to hover, how to back bounce, how to wrap your plugs, what colors to choose, blah, 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 blah. So check that out. Plug Fishing for River Salmon by yours truly on Amazon. And uh, like I say, for the... For the cost of less than uh, a pack of uh, replacement trebles, uh, you get a lot of good inside skinny on uh, salmon fish in there. So there's my little uh, selfless plug. Okay, uh, let's see. Any more new questions? Now, okay, so what do we got here? Uh, why is it important to clean plugs after finishing or after fishing? And how? what's the best way to do it? Davis L. is the person's name. So Davis Getting back to the uh, wrapping sardines, tuna, eggs, bacon, Jerry Lampkin, um, and all the other stuff we're talking about. Uh, you get this, this goo on your plugs, and if you don't wash that off, let me show you what happens. I've got this in a Ziploc baggie because I didn't want to open it in the house, but here's a plug that somehow... Got forgotten. I think maybe now nah, this is actually this isn't even mine because that's not my rigging. So I must have found this one or something. So here's a uh, here's what a sardine looks like after it's uh, been left on there for um, a while, and you can imagine, yeah, that that doesn't smell good. So that's what you're trying to avoid. And and if I tried to peel that off right now, it's like cement. You're gonna peel the paint off. So. At the end of each day, what I do is I keep a little bucket of soapy water with lemon, non-ultra joy, in uh, just a couple of squirts of lemon in, in this bucket of water. And after I get done with the plug, I cut the wrap off and throw it in there. And it just kind of sloshes around for the rest of the day. And then when I get done, at the end of the, you know, get to the boat ramp or whatever, take a little soft plastic brush, use that soapy water, scrub it a little bit, dip it in the water into the, you know, non and in, to rinse water and leave them out to dry and you're good to go. It doesn't take long and you avoid that gross uh, baked on plug scenario. And what, what happens is that um, that sardine or whatever you got on there gets rancid. And the whole point is to make it smell attractive and appealing to salmon, right? So something like that thing down there is, uh, is going to be more of a fish repellent than a fish attractor. So um that that's that's how you do you don't need the lemon soap and guys are really edgy about it used to be lemon fresh joy and then that went away and then lemon ultra came out well you can't use lemon ultra for some reason tell you what dollar store the lemon ajax i've used for a hundred years you know you get a thing of it this big for 99 cents had no issues with it um you can also hit them like before you put plugs away for the end of the season, like say the fall's over and it's winter time, uh, clean them all off. And then I'll even hit them with a little WD just to, you know, just to keep them protected. So anyway, hope that uh, Davis helps you. Okay. Let's see. Uh, JD, what's the weirdest thing you've caught a salmon on? Hmm. 
Well, I assume you're talking kings here because I have caught silver salmon on um, everything from gummy worm. I mean, we've we've thrown hot dogs. I mean, they, they just bite anything. So um, I, I'm assuming kings. And let's see. I have caught kings on, uh, I've caught a lot of kings uh, striper fishing. Um, so I've caught them on quite a few of them actually on like swim baits, like fish traps, that kind of thing, like a half ounce lead head with a, you know, four inch white rubber tail. Um, I've caught them on, um, let's see. Well, I haven't caught them on, but I know a lot of guys who've caught them on live minnows in the river, which is really interesting to me considering, you know, the whole thing about them not supposed to be feeding, but guys fishing stripers with jumbo minnows will catch Kings every year. Guys catch them on sardines on the bottom. Um, that one, that one's interesting to me too. You think about a king just cruising up river, and it's hard to imagine him going, mm, nom, 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 you know, eating a sardine out of the muck. But uh, they do it. Um, I've caught them on a lot of different lures, um, b -b 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 night crawlers. Also, let's see, I've got a couple. Let's see, where is it? So we were fishing for smallmouth one day with this little. I think it was a bandit lure. Got one on that. Nice springer. Let's see. I think I have a picture of that one somewhere. Uh, da, da, da. Here we go. Yeah, look at this chrome springer. You can see that little little plug in the uh, same plug right here. That plug right there in its in its jaw. Uh, nice chrome chrome springer. Uh, rip baits fishing for stripers. Got them on those too. Um, so let's see. Anything else? Do, 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 do. I think that's, I'm sure I'm missing something, but, uh, um, uh, you know, we've caught them fishing for trout with like little teeny hotshot fifties. Um, I think that's kind of it. Um, I don't know. There's, I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting something, but, uh, ah, rattle traps. Yep. Absolutely. I forgot about that one. Uh, anybody who's striper fish to the Delta enough or the Sacramento rivers probably caught one. Um, on a rattle trap um so uh let's see here we go some years in the klamath they're rolling all over but won't hit a spinner some years they will all color the vibrant what gives ah yes that's a that's an interesting question uh, a lot of times that might have to do with especially on the lower klamath water temperature um if the water temp and it often is in that lower klamath 70 degrees or above that's kind of my threshold point where once it goes over 70, I mean, 70 is right at the top of getting kings to bite. And so that might be happening there. Um, you just get to the point where they they are so um, kind of just focusing on survival that, um, you know, biting something's just not in the in the in the works that day. Um, and then sometimes, I don't know, it can be a weather thing. Kings can be real moody. They Sometimes, like you say, bite like piranhas, and sometimes they don't. Um, you get a weird, especially like up there on the Klamath where the weather's warm in the fall, and all of a sudden you get a real change in the weather, say uh, just a kind of a freak front. It happens in the Sacramento Valley. It happens everywhere. But you get a real drastic temperature change, barometric change can put them off the bite, and then the next day they can be right back on. So um, it, it, what it does is drive the angler uh, crazy, and I'm sure you've been there uh, Federalist 45, um, you know, circ cycling through every lure you have going, what is it? And it's probably nothing you're doing wrong. It's just, they're not biting that day for whatever reason. So speaking of the Klamath, three quarter ounce gold cast master. Yep. Trolling that lower estuary in the Klamath. Uh, that is a killer. That was the first thing I ever hooked a Klamath fish on standing at the mouth was a, was a cast master back when people actually used to fish the mouth a little bit. Um, Anyway, uh, JR says, got here late. Favorite leader length on cut plug in the Metro with short bus for ultra. Okay, so getting back to the old rotating flasher thing with the, the cut plug behind it. Um, I started off when I first started, whoa, dropping stuff. Um, first started using that thing, um, I would say I was at four feet. And every year I keep bringing it down to do what, what really kind of changed my tune one time was I have my guys reeling up and you can see the flasher come to the surface and you can see a King 
nipping at the flasher. And so he's nipping at the flasher. The lure's back behind him. Like the lure's back by his tail, not by his head. He can't even see it. So uh, I'm starting to starting to shrink it down. Yeah, 24 inches, 27 inches, somewhere in there. Um, and if it's not working, you know, kind of mess with it. Um, I mean, the whole idea of the flasher is to draw them in. So you don't want your thing so far back that they don't even notice. You know, they, they see this, but they don't notice what's behind it. And I, I've had that situation here lately on Tahoe, trolling downriggers. And on the screen, you can see the downrigger ball. And then you'll see these Mackinac come up off the bottom and go right back down. And I'm thinking, oh, well, you looked at the ball as it went by. But my lure is 60 feet behind it. So I've started, when I see that, I shorten the drop on that too. So um, I, I, I guess the, the answer would be I have air on shorter than longer um, without getting specific because everybody's kind of got a different rig. And uh, But you know, a couple feet probably is the, uh, the way to go on that. So, okay, next question is... Uh, JD, I have watched your topwater video, your topwater coho videos at least a thousand times. Well, thank you. Um, will that work for Kings and which plug do you use? Okay, well, um, if you haven't seen the topwater coho videos, I'm sure I'll do a new one this year. Um, I'm going to Alaska again to work uh, this fall and I'll try to shoot some more because I have a new camera which has a better zoom on it. But if you go to the YouTube channel, which some of you guys are watching on anyway, uh, look up Topwater Salmon. I forget what I call it. Best Topwater Salmon Bites or something. It's it's on, uh, I think, the uh, JD's Fishing Adventures uh, playlist or something like that. But there's a couple Topwater videos that are, are pretty, pretty fun. Uh, and so what we throw up there, is I just buy Rebel Pop R's. They're only like five bucks. And I spray paint them pink, and it doesn't have to be too fancy. And I just put a single hook on the back because we released so many fish. And uh, it's it's super, super fun, I got to say, <laughs> um, watching coho come up and, and eat that thing like striped bass or something. As far as kings go, I, you know, I've had countless kings eat my bobber when I'm row fishing. I've not caught one on surface. I've taken like one year I took a big pencil popper to Alaska and painted it pink because that's what the color they seem to like. And I thought, I'm going to catch a king on a topwater plug. Well, I didn't. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, uh, yeah, kings don't seem to want to come up. So I was on a little river in Alaska years ago and we were again fishing. Um, we were fishing actually cheaters, you know, like a big corky. They're the biggest size they made. That's all we had for bobbers that year. We'd run out or something. So we're just putting a toothpick in there, toothpick in there. Like it was a strike indicator and fishing eggs blow it. And I had three guys fishing and I gave them each a different color float. Again, a cheater or corky, whatever you want to call it. One was chartreuse. One was, uh, I don't know, red or something. And the other one was, uh, hot pink well the hot pink guy had five fish five kings that day come up and eat his float so the next time we went to that river i was thinking hmm i think i, I went to the uh the the fly shop not the fly shop but our little tackle shed at the lodge and i dug up some flies and i found one of those pink wogs a deer hair fly that's uh, designed for surface fishing for cohos bright pink and i said guys when we get to this one particular couple sets of holes do you mind if i just flop this fly out real quick i just want to see if i can catch a king on a dry fly before you guys go there and, and mow them down with eggs oh yeah 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 we got to see this and so that year i had let's see there was this one hole and there were about 40 kings in it and i flopped that pink fly out and this one the smallest fish in the hole it was a jack of you know probably five or six pounds he came up and you'd look at it and go, nope, down. All the ones around him wouldn't even wouldn't even look up at all. About every fifth or tenth cast, he'd come back up, nope. And we did that little dance for probably an hour. And I kept thinking, come on, just eat it. I just want to say I caught a king on a dry fly. I mean, how cool would that be? And I'm sure it's been done. It's not like I would have been the first person. But um, 
it didn't happen. And then I had another one. Um, I, I threw it out across this flat and uh, I had one swirl on it. So another day I threw it out and I was just kind of skating this thing through the tail out. And this big red one just followed my fly all the way to shore and just wouldn't commit. So I'm like, ah, oh, so close. But, oh, well, uh, maybe one day I'll catch a king on a dry. That would be pretty cool. So here we go. What else we got? Joshua, I fished Grace Falls, which is on the Trinity, 10 years ago. I really miss my freezer full of sushi-grade kings. Yeah. Uh, friends of mine went to Grace Falls on the opener on July 1st and said it was um, uh, epically full of moss, and uh, there were not very many salmon around. So you're not missing anything right at the moment, but I, but I hear you. Um, okay, next question from Brian K. I was wondering when you're trolling plugs with a spreader or slider, will they dive into the ground? I try to troll them close to the bottom. How do you count for the dive? That's a good question. Um, you have to go with a longer dropper um, and a slower speed, basically. Um, but that's definitely an issue. If you notice that your your uh, when you reel up your bill is all you know sanded like that, you're probably doing a lot of digging, especially if there's no paint on the leading edge. You know you're you're digging that. So one of the things you can do is is keep in mind when you're trolling for kings. You don't always have to be right on the bottom. Near the bottom, yes, but not always right on the bottom. So uh, you could just drop your, your rig down to the bottom, clunk, feel it hit a couple times, and then just come up a few cranks. And just, you know, you're down there. And every once in a while, just, just reestablish contact with the bottom so you know you're in the zone. But um, you don't have to be, your sinker doesn't have to be pounding the bottom. They will come up a little bit for it. So just just get down near it, but, but don't... Uh, you know, you don't have to be right pounding the sand. Okay. What else we got here? Uh, want to try bobber fishing this year. What bobber do you recommend and where do you set the stop for depth of your drift? Well, that depends on if you're bobber dogging or uh, suspended float fishing. Um, all the Hawken fishing floats, I really, really like. So go to Hawken fishing. Um, they have this kind of, it's real durable, soft foam kind of stuff that they make their floats out of. And, uh, really good floats um if oh yeah that's a that's a uh that's a tough question now so if you're suspended fishing you're gonna uh, it depends on where the fish are sometimes i'll fish a 30 foot deep hole and the fish are only you know six or eight feet below the surface sometimes they're 30 feet down right on the bottom so if you're fishing a uh a slip float uh suspended style uh, you got to just kind of mess around with your depth till you, you figure out where you're uh, where you're Fisherland. If you're going to fish bobber dog in style, typically you're going to just to start off, set it about um, a time and a half the depth of the water. Um, that'll get you in the zone. If you noticed, uh, you know, when you're bobber dogging, your float should be flat and kind of tap it along the bottom. If you notice it's standing up, you're not hitting the bottom. So adjust it. You don't want it um, pounding the bottom really hard. So, um, you know, just keep messing with it till you get it to where it's just kind of laying flat and, and just lightly, lightly cruising the bottom. So um, hopefully that helps, Mr. Mueller. OK, so uh, da, 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 what else do we have from Harvey? How do I fish really, really deep, slow pools with plugs? Ones that don't have much current. OK, so I'm glad you asked because we were kind of alluding to that earlier when we were talking about. Oops, we've got two plugs here. This is where the T55, where did my T60 go? Huh. I don't know. Put it so, oh, here it is. There we go. So that's where these two giant plugs come in handy, T55s and T60s. And it's one of the inherent issues of uh, fishing rivers where, you know, kings typically like to lay in, in slow, deep pools, right? Well, some slow, deep pools don't have any flow. I fish a few of these um, on several of the rivers I, I hit, and to the point where the current is so slow, you can't really even fish a bobber through it because it doesn't go anywhere. It just kind of sits there like a lake. And there's just a tiny, almost imperceptible bit of current. Um, you could throw a spinner or something, but usually these slow spots are really deep, so it's hard to get it down. So what do you do? Well, in a, uh, in a drift boat, or a uh, drift boat's really probably the best way to do it because you have such fine little control so what i'll do is and it kind of gets back to this uh let's see 
go back to my hovering diagram here. Um, typically in those, those big slow holes, the fish aren't always right on the bottom. They're a little bit suspended. And the trick is you want to get your plug down there, but your plug is buoyant, right? These, these things have a lot of, a lot of a flotation in them. Um, there's not much current. To, you can't get it to dive. You put a back bounce rig on it and you get it to the bottom and it doesn't go anywhere. And so how do you get the plug in, in cases like, say, the Trinity River in California that are really, really clear? You don't want to be right on top of the fish because you're going to spook them. So you need to get that away from you. But there's not much current. So what do you do? Well, that's where a giant plug like the T60 comes in handy. Doesn't have a whole lot of dive, but it's got a lot of surface area to it. And so what I'll do is getting back to this picture, run a like a three-way rig like you see there. And then with the big plug, you have to find the right balance. Okay, so you got to get just enough weight. And in, in, in this case, you're probably talking no more than an ounce, probably more like three quarters or half, even less. It depends on the current. You got to kind of figure it out. Each spot is different. But you let this out because it's got enough surface area that can kind of pull the weight out. And then you got to free spool the sinker down. And, and what I usually do is go down, say, like five feet. Then you put your thumb on it. And that thing slowly kind of sinks down because of the weight. And once it gets tight, it starts to throb just a little bit, right? So then, okay, the current's got it. So you play out a little bit more line and get it back a little deeper. And it's it's a process. I mean, it's slow going. And then sometimes you got to reel on it to get it going a little bit. And it, again, you're trying to get enough weight to get it down. But you're using the big plug. To be able to pull that weight backwards in the current if you used a little plug like this guy there's no surface area so almost any amount of weight is going to sink it to the bottom so you need this big buoyant guy to pull that weight back but you got to have just enough weight to get this big guy down right so it takes a long time and it's you know letting out putting your thumb down letting it thump a little bit okay there it goes let a little more out let it thump and eventually some of these holes like I'll have the rods and the lines going almost straight down and this thing in that slow current, again, because it's so wide, it, it has some action. The little plug in that slow current is going to just almost be sitting there doing nothing. This thing's going thump, thump. I mean, it's you think of, you know, you want something more like that. But this little wobble right here actually is very deadly. And on the end of your rod, it's going dunk, dunk. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it, there's not much happening and what i tell people is um because we're holding the rods you can't really put the rods in the holders in that situation because you're constantly kind of feeding line or bringing a little in to get it to, to all keep working and we'll be in the drift boat you know of course the drift boat has the the gunnels that come up forward in front of you i'm always telling people hey make sure you hold your rod way up because when they bite this thing there's two types of bites one is Bam! It just slams your rod down hard. There's none of that pumping stuff. They just whack. And I mean, you could snap a rod so easy doing that. So it, it's shocking how it must just make them crazy down there. That thing just going, he can't bite me. You know, and they just go nuts. The other bite you get on it that's interesting. And it's, I'm not sure why one's, you know, one day is one way, one day is the other way, but you get this little tink, 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 tink. Like, like it's a trout and you think, okay, there's a little smolt down there uh, nibbling on my sardine or something. And so one day out of frustration, I was going ding, 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 ding. And I said, just jerk on that. So that little guy goes away and the guy goes, whoa, there's a fish. <laughs> so um, it's interesting how I would love to see, I'd love to get my camera down there and see if they're just like kissing it or what they're doing or mouthing it. But uh, so those are two types of the slam or that dunk, dunk, is what you get in that slow water stuff. It's pretty fun, actually. I really like that uh, that style of fishing. It's 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 kind of labor intensive. It's it's um, I don't know. It's it's slow moving, but it's also exciting. You get that thing down there, and you just feel rod going thump, 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 and it just the anticipation. I don't know. I'm getting excited about it, thinking about it. So, um, geez, it's been an hour and ten minutes already. We're we're flying. 
Um, I probably ought to wrap this up, but if you guys have any other questions, uh, throw them up there real quick before we get out of here. Um, of course, you can always go to fishwithjd.com and uh, check out the website. Um, if you want to go fishing, um, I don't even have the banner up, but you can go to Fish with JD and there's a link there. But uh, if you want to go fishing with me, salmon fishing this fall, Tahoe fishing right now, um, just go to www dot the sportfisher.com uh, and again fish with jd will get you there uh, just click on the little ad and then uh for you youtube users feel free to subscribe down right yeah somewhere somewhere in that area yes um if you like what you're doing and don't forget you can uh, see all these you know if you miss it live or if, you know you have a buddy who said oh i missed that don't forget these are all archived on youtube so you can go back and check them out later um okay we got another question here uh steve says uh will you come back to the american river yeah i'll, I'll probably be around this fall steve um if you know the only reason i would stay away from the american is if the fishing sucks and it just hasn't been that good last few years um but uh i, I would love to i mean that's that's where i grew up so i love that river i'm 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 heartbroken to see what, how they've uh, mismanaged it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I should be down there. BK says, uh, put out more of your eBooks. Ah, yes, I should do that. Um, if you go to Amazon, I do have. Uh, okay, so I've got. Let me think if I can remember my books. Got the the plug fishing book that we just talked about. Let's just shameless plug it one more time. So there's that one. Oops, I got Brian's comment over it. <laughs> um, so I've got that one. I've got the, uh, what else do I have? Um, oh, I have the striper fishing one. I have a surf perch fishing one. I have the, oh, the giant one that's 300 pager is uh, steelhead bank fishing. Um, I feel like there's another one that I can't think of right now. Uh, there's a side drift in book, which is actually a hard book, but nobody side drifts anymore. So, um, but yeah, those are all on Amazon. Check them out. And they're all uh, pretty inexpensive. So. Um, Anyway, I appreciate, uh, appreciate the thought. I will do more of that. And let's see what else. Steve says, yeah, it's been crummy referring to the American. Um, yeah, it's it's unfortunate because what happens for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with the American, it's a tributary to the Sacramento River. And it's the furthest one south um, on the Sacramento system. And these are all dam controlled rivers. And when they need to deliver water to the Delta to control uh salinity levels they flush it out of the american because it's the closest one they uh the american gets hit hard too with a lot of uh water to the southern ag uh, deliveries and so it's kind of a sacrificial lamb and and biologists have admitted to us that it's just it's kind of a hopeless thing which really sucks because um the, the american was so good and it wasn't that long ago that really was good and, and i'm sure that uh, I mean, that situation plays out all over the joint, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's a sad story. I had, uh, when I was launching at, uh, I guess that was yesterday, Tahoe, a couple old timers said, oh man, the fishing here just ain't what it used to be. And I said, <laughs> I said to him, uh, insert name of water here. And, and that's pretty much a true statement, right? I mean, you know, Pyramid Lake, that's, that's one that's, uh, actually better than it used to be. And there's a few bright spots, but gosh you look up and down the coast and, and and i guess i'm thinking more in the salmon and steelhead world there's there's uh, a lot of things that are going bad with that type of stuff and and since it's a salmon episode this week i figured uh you know we'll just talk that but i guess there's there's you know bass lakes and stuff that are doing good but uh generally um fishing seems like it's going downhill and that's bums me out and the ocean's got issues and all that and uh, i don't really want to end on a sour note so we won't uh by the way, not a Baltimore Orioles fan, thank goodness, because uh, apparently they um, really suck right now. But uh, I, I wore this hat to commemorate that my first hardball game of the season, which I play on the Old Man Orioles, is Friday. So actually, there was one yesterday, but I was working. The game started at 8.45 in Sacramento. I had to be back in Tahoe at 4.45 in the morning. and just wasn't going to work. So Friday night game is a little earlier, so I'm going to be able to fish that morning. Go down there, play ball, be back up fishing Saturday morning. So 
anyway, commemorating the opening day of Old Man Little League. So excited about that. Um, anyway, hey, it's uh, we've been here for an hour and 15 minutes. I really appreciate you guys all tuning in. This has been fun. Um, thanks for all the questions. Great questions tonight. Um, we were going to have um, Greg Brush from Easy Limits Guide Service on this week. Uh, he is a uh, big time Kenai River guide who's been there forever and, and really active in the conservation of the Kenai. So we were going to get kind of a state of the union address about what's going on in the Kenai. He had a bunch of other stuff going. So I said, don't worry about it. I can handle it. Had all these questions from people anyway. So uh, we'll get him on for sure. And hey, by the way, if you guys have any guests that you would like or topics that you guys would like to have uh, on the show sometime in the future, Feel free to leave them in the comments or email me, text me if you got my, you know, my digits, yo. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, just uh, let me know if you got any suggestions because I'm always open to ideas. Um, uh, so anyway, hope you guys have a great weekend. Uh, go catch some fish. And uh, I am going to be, oh, you know what? I saw one other question that I didn't get to, which was, where was it? Brian Ricucci, my man, he had a question. I'm, I forgot to answer it. Now I can't find it. Oh, there it is. Uh, oh, there's another real or another question too. Uh, when's the new boat show up? Uh, I just got word that I'm going to be able to pick it up on the 18th. I don't know if my schedule will allow that. So soon the new, new cabin boat will be here. And here's a question that I'm sorry I missed, Jeff. Looking at pairing a bait caster with my nine foot Akuma Salilo. I'm new to casting reels. For flossing at the Feather River and the Klamath. Any cheap suggestions? Um, you know, the good old Ambassador 5500 is, uh, you know, pretty inexpensive, pretty bulletproof. And um, I would suggest, uh, you know, that, uh, yeah, that's probably the best one. That, that's, that'll, that'll, that'll suit you just fine. So, Anyway, uh, that looks like we are all good. Let's see. Hang on. We got a few more questions here I missed. Uh, let's see. What do we got here? Are you going to fish? Uh, yes. Yes. You said Buzz. Uh, ha, ha. Yeah, Buzz Ramsey. Jack Glass is a real nice guy, too. Yeah, I met Brandon Glass this year, but not Jack Glass. I've never met him. Famous uh, guides from the North Coast. Great show. Thanks, Jerry Lampkin. I uh, hope you're feeling better, my man. Heard you were sick. And um, hope you are among the living. So anyway, I guess that's it, guys. Thanks for tuning in. I uh, appreciate it, as always. Uh, again, let me know if you got anybody who you want to see on here or questions or um, topics that you want covered, because we will try to make it happen. Until next week when i don't know who's going to be on it might be me again i don't know i mean i'll be here for sure but i don't know if somebody will be joining me because i'm a procrastinator and i usually wait till like two days before and go oh i gotta find somebody so uh, so if you guys give me some suggestions maybe i'll get on that a little sooner so anyway all right cool well we'll uh we'll do this again i'll uh, see you next wednesday thanks for tuning in and uh i gotta go tie some leaders because i gotta fish tomorrow so i will catch you next week see you guys later <laughs>